I have a statement on the Democratic Republic of the Congo. The Secretary General is disturbed by reports of killings on Sunday in Kinshasa of at least six people during protests calling for the full implementation of the December 31st, 2016 political agreement in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Reports also suggest that 63 people were injured. He calls on Congolese authorities to conduct credible investigations into these incidents and hold those responsible accountable. The Secretary General urges the Congolese security forces to exercise restraint and to uphold the Congolese people's right to freedom of speech and peaceful assembly. He also calls on, them, uh, calls on all concerned to ensure full respect of places of worship. The Secretary General once again calls on the Congolese political actors to work towards the full implementation of the December 31st political agreement, which remains the only viable path to the holding of elections, the peaceful transfer of power, and the consolidation of stability in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Turning to Yemen, <clears throat> the UN Special Envoy for Yemen, Ismail Ul Sheikh Ahmed, has informed the Secretary General that he does not intend to continue in his position beyond the end of his current contract, which ends in February of this year. The Special Envoy takes the opportunity to express his sincere thanks to the Secretary General for his strong and determined support to reach a political solution to the conflict that has engulfed the country. In this moment, uh, the thoughts of Mr. Ismail Ul Sheikh Ahmed go first with the Yemeni people who are worn out by this conflict and are enduring one of the most devastating humanitarian crises in the world. The Special Envoy remains committed to pursue through diplomacy an end to the violence and a political solution that meets the legitimate aspirations of the Yemeni people until a successor is named. And I'd like to add that uh, the Envoy uh, was ye yesterday concluded a four-day visit to, the, to Saudi Arabia, where he met with the Yemeni president and the Minister of Foreign Affairs, as well as a number of Yemeni political and government figures. The Assistant Secretary General for Political Affairs, Miroslav Yencha, is currently on a three-day visit to Iraq. Mr. Yencha met yesterday uh, with Prime Minister al-Abadi, Vice President al-Nujafi, and the Speaker of the Parliament, Salim al jubouri as well as the recently appointed Electoral Board of Commissioners. They discussed how the UN can best contribute to Iraq, particularly on the National and Provincial Council elections scheduled on the 12th of May 2018, among other topics. Today, Mr. Yencha is visiting Mosul. He has witnessed firsthand the resilience of the city's people and their determination to rise from rebuilding their lives after more than three years of suffering under the Daesh terrorist regime. Today, he will meet with Vice President Nouri al-Maliki. Uh, sorry, tomorrow he will meet with uh, the Vice President Nouri al-Maliki, the Foreign Affairs Minister Ibrahim al-Jafari, clerics and party leaders uh, Amar al-Hakim, women and minority leaders. And we'll have a note with more details. And as you will have seen yesterday, we issued a statement in which the Secretary General condemned the attack that took place in Afghanistan at the Intercontinental Hotel in Kabul. He extends his deepest condolences to the families of the victims and expresses solidarity with the government and people of Afghanistan. Turning to Liberia, the special representative and head of the UN Office for West Africa and the Sahel, Mohamed Mchambas, represented the Secretary General at the inauguration of George Weah as President of Liberia in the first peaceful handover of power in the country since 1944. The Assistant Secretary General for Peacekeeping Operations, Bintu Keita, and the head of the UN mission in Liberia, Farid Zarif, were also present at the ceremony in Monrovia. The UN congratulates the government and the people of Liberia on this historical milestone in, uh, excuse me, historical milestones in the country's democracy, and we wish President Weah success in fulfilling his vision for Liberia. The UN has been honored to walk this historic path with the people of Liberia, and we expect the uh, special representative, Mr. Zarif, to speak to you uh, here later this week. <clears throat> Back here at headquarters, uh, the Deputy Secretary General Amina Mohammed spoke at the fourth annual symposium of the role of religion and faith-based organizations in international affairs, and she did so on the topic of migration. She highlighted the work of faith-based organizations around the world who are often on the front lines of crises, providing food, shelter, education, medical and psychological support to migrants and refugees. She stressed that their contributions are essential to put in place processes that will make migration safe for all. 
The Deputy Secretary General also noted that the world is undergoing a crisis of solidarity with political prejudice, intolerance, and xenophobia against refugees and migrants becoming per pervasive in all religions and emphasized that faith-based organization can help the positive story of migration and ensure the responsible and proportionate response from media and policymakers to migration challenges. And you will see that on Saturday, the Secretary General spoke at the Holocaust Remembrance Ceremony at the Park East Synagogue, in which he spoke on uh, anti-Semitism and the continued threats posed by right-wing extremists. And those remarks were put online. The Under Secretary General for Peacekeeping Operations, Jean-Pierre Lacroix, will brief the C-34 Special Committee on Peacekeeping Operations this afternoon on the report of peacekeeping fatalities and injuries due to violent acts. He will inform the committee members of the content of the report and the Secretariat's action plan to respond to the report's findings and recommendations. This follows informal briefings to troop and police contributing countries and the Security Council last Thursday. We expect the report and a summary of the action plan to be released to member states and to you a bit later today. And at 2 p.m. in the visitor's lobby, the Secretary General will speak at the Peace is Acceptance event, where he will talk about the need to pursue peace through many different pathways, including mediation, prevention, and art and culture. An Afghan refugee performer, Sonita Alizadeh, is scheduled to sing at the event. Uh, and later at 3 p.m., he will speak to the ECOSOC uh, Economic and Social Council uh, on his uh, reform plan for the development system of the United Nations on his report that is, uh, that is released. The um, UNHCR and its partners today released a study which highlights the 10 most underreported humanitarian crises in 2017. At uh, top of the list is the DRC, uh, excuse me, at the top of the list, let me rephrase that, is the Democratic People's Republic of Korea. UNHCR says that while the country has made headlines for its nuclear uh, programs, its humanitarian for its nuclear program, its humanitarian situation has received the least media attention globally. Other crises that rarely make the headlines were Eritrea, Burundi, Sudan, Central African Republic, the Democratic Republic of the Congo, Mali, the Lake Chad Basin uh, region, which encompasses Niger, Cameroon, and Chad, Vietnam, and Peru. And in his address to the Executive Board of the World Health Organization, its Director General, Dr. Tedros, said he was deeply saddened by the shocking news that two polio workers, a mother and a daughter, had been shot dead in Pakistan. It's an outrage that a mother and her 16-year-old daughter could be murdered while trying to protect the health of children, he said, recalling that in the first three quarters of last year, 44 health workers were killed while doing their jobs, trying to save lives and trying to protect people. This will not derail us from eradicating polio or this from the services we give to save lives, he said. You can find his full address online. And today we thank our friends in Canada and Luxembourg who have paid their regular budget dues in full, bringing us up to 13. 13. Mr. Lee, All right. you have the floor. Okay, I was going to ask you about the DRC, but actually yeah. I want to ask you about... Um, as, as I'm sure you know, Jan Beagle has written to The Guardian about the Indeed. series about sexual harassment. Mm -hmm. And among other things, she said unequivocally that UN staff are free to speak, free to, speak to the media, which, if true, is, is a great thing. I just wanted to ask you about, there's a, there's a UN rule uh, that says that, that for statements or announcements to the press, uh, permission is required, and I'm aware of a, a number of cases. But, mm -hmm. for example, the case of Emma Riley in the UN system, at uh, the Office of uh, High Commissioner of Human Rights, she was explicitly told that she could not speak to the press. And I know that because that was explained to me. And uh, look, uh, so, so they, can you, I guess, are, what so I want to do is rather than to play, okay, okay, can they, you make clear, if, if in fact you're announcing that sp staff can speak freely and will not be retaliated against, this would be the time? Um, there are media guidelines in which uh, staff members are, um, are, uh, are told they can speak to the press in their areas of, of responsibility. Obviously, I think it, it's clear that they should tell, they should do it in concert with their, their supervisors. They need to be some, some coherence. But I think the, 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 the larger point is if the staff members feel they have been uh, wrong, they have, ex they, have not, they have exhausted every uh, avenue, uh, they feel they live in a climate of, of fear, um, 
the press remains uh, remains an outlet. But I guess my, my, my question, she didn't say that you have to, I understand as whistleblowers, there's all kinds of rules of what you have to exhaust right. your right. ability inside the system before you speak, but that's not what Jan Beagle told The Guardian. She said staff aren't, aren't prohibited at all, and I want to read you something that, that Emma Riley, this was quoted to her, quote, as a, as a conduct provision within the UN system, it would not be proper for international civil servants to err personal grievances or criticize their organizations in public. And obviously, uh, there, the there, there, as I said, there, there, are media, there are media guidelines. Right. And obviously, as I, as I, I'll repeat what I've said, sure. if people feel they've exhausted every avenue and they need to, quote unquote, blow the whistle on a situation, the press remains an outlet. Right, but if they, okay, get, I, if they get retaliated I, against, I, can they, can they, they hold they, up the We do and, not want to have, we, we are working I think with great effort in ensuring that we create an atmosphere in which um, staff members of, are feel they can they can speak up uh, to their supervisors to other outlets and report on harassment or retaliation. That is our focus. Yes, sir. And then thank you, thank you, Stefan. Two questions. The first is uh, who will replace Khaled al Sheikh Ahmed and. The second question is, uh, why no statement from Secretary General, General about the situation in Afrin, Syria? Um, sorry, say again. I, sorry, I was trying to... Uh, Which one? No, both. I'm sorry. I, well, uh, so, so. the first question is, who will replace Khalid Oh, uh, that, that, that's an ongoing... Uh, that's oh, an ongoing... Sorry, uh, that's a... Ismail Yes, sorry. There and we the go. second question is let about... Me, let me get focused back to where I actually am. <laughs> uh, that's an ongoing process. Uh, as you know... Uh, <laughs> We do not want to have, we're, well, we have something to announce, we will. Uh, we would very much hope that there is uh, little or no gap uh, between the departure of the special envoy and the arrival of his successor. Uh, as for Afrin, we're obviously following that situation extremely closely. Uh, we're very much concerned uh, about the ongoing reports of fighting and military operations in the Afrin uh, district. As far as our humanitarian colleagues have told us, there are about 324,000 men, women, and children, including 126,000 already displaced. So the, the risk uh, to civilians is, uh, is, is grace. It, the, the continued fighting, the military operations has placed these civilians uh, in harm's way. Um, as I said, many of these people have already been uh, displaced uh, once, if not, uh, if not twice. Uh, in fact, 60% of the population of the district um, is in need of humanitarian aid and relies on humanitarian aid. Um, we have been uh, preparing for a large-scale uh, response, depending on the needs of the civilian population. And again, we cannot stress enough the need uh, for all parties involved to protect civilians, to protect civilian infrastructure, and to respect uh, international law. One yep. I find, uh, the issue of access, does the UN have access to well, the you know, we, if, if, I, it, if conflict is ongoing, if fighting is ongoing, access remains greatly challenged. Linda. Um, thank you, Steph. Um, I was just wondering, regarding the DPRK, I believe you mentioned that it's, um, it is the, reportedly the least um, prom, uh, least yes, reported. reported. Yes, exactly. <laughs> humanitarian crisis yeah. in the world today. Does that also mean that it's the least funded um, humanitarian operation? Uh, I think we'd have to look at the, the, I mean, the question, uh, I think the, the question to look at, is it the one where there is the largest gap between the needs and the actual funds? We'll look at the OCHA uh, numbers and I'll let you know. I don't have the numbers on top of my head, but it's a very valid question. Madame. Uh, you, thank you, Stefan. Following up uh, on the Turkish troop uh, attack, U.S.-backed uh, Kurds in Syria, uh, do you know if uh, the Secretary General uh, called uh, um, President Erdogan or in contact with uh, there, been Trump contacts, regarding uh, there, this There have been contacts uh, at various levels, uh, and Mr. Feldman has also been briefing the, the Security Council on the situation. So, oh, sorry, Nizar, then uh, Masoud. Yeah, yeah the, on the situation in Hodeida, can you elaborate a little bit about uh, who is running Al Hodeida seaport now? Uh, as we hear that more uh, aid is coming through it, and also the cranes, are they really being reinstalled? Uh, the cranes, as far as uh, we were able to report last week, they are, they are operational. The four mobile cranes 
are operational, uh, which is allowing us to um, uh, to bring in uh, bring in aid. Obviously, the 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 level of aid that's coming in is not sufficient to meet the needs of the people, and we're trying to. Uh, we would ask anyone who has impact and influence to ensure that the uh, the pipeline is as full as possible. I don't have any comment on the security situation as to who controls but, uh, uh, what. But uh, mo another thing, there were rumors that Mr. Wilcheck Ahmed was uh, censured in Saudi Arabia for not being able to arrange a deal good enough for Hodeida. Can you confirm or deny that? No, I can't confirm it. I'm not aware of Mr. Uh, Ismail Sheikh Hamad being censored in any way, shape, or form. Mr. I, I, uh, I'll, 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 Nizar, I'll, Nizar, I'll come back to you. Richard. I know the UN uh, would rather not comment on these types of situations, but could you give us any information on a UN convoy in Kabul, unless I missed it, uh, that was attacked? Maybe people are missing, somebody was killed. Can you comment? No, I'm not aware of a... Uh, you, you, it's not that I don't want to comment, but as usual, you may know more. Um, you may know more than I do. I'm not aware of a, of a specific convoy having been. Uh, Let me rephrase: a UN vehicle. Remove the word convoy. Um, listen, I'm not going to comment on any. Um, uh, it's it's our policy, as you say, not to comment on any reports involving these kinds of, of incidents as it may jeopardize the safety of staff involved. Oleg, and then Masoud, sorry. Thank you, Stefan. Uh, can you please comment on reports that um, a UN employee was kidnapped in Kabul, and are there any efforts to get her released? Sorry, I'm, I think that was Richard's oh. question. I'm really sorry. Then. That's okay. But uh, anyway, I uh, won't the, censure you. The regular yeah. question uh, on Sochi: Is there any clarity whether the UN is going to take? No, we're obviously decision? watching those developments uh, very closely and are in touch with uh, the organizers, but no decision as of yet. Masoud, I know, uh, Stefan. Thank you. I know you're a little reluctant to answer these questions. Uh, the situation in occupied Kashmir is getting bad to us, and India and Pakistan are exchanging fires across the border. Do you have any, I mean, I mean, any thing from the Secretary General on this? Is the Secretary General concerned about the situation? We're, we're obviously aware, uh, we're following this, uh, what's been going on really for the last 10, 10 days. Uh, and I, I think our, again, the Secretary General would, would encourage uh, both sides uh, to address any outstanding issues through dialogue. I mean, on the, my, 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 I would just wonder it up as to what is the reason? This is one of the move, the crisis simmering for a very long time, and the border exchanges and people have been killed. But why isn't Secretary General so keen to involve himself in this crisis? As a matter of principle, right, I'm not talking specifically about this issue, but about any issue where there is conflict between parties. Uh, the Secretary General's good offices are always uh, available, and is in any issue, uh, both parties, or more than, you know, if there are multiple parties, everyone uh, needs to agree on involving the United Nations. That is true of any mediation effort. Yes, sir. Good afternoon. There's been reports of uh, armed attacks in the north central Nigeria by harassmen since uh, January 1 this year. And the UN, you know, seems to be silent. There's not been any statement from the UN. You know, and uh, more than 100 people have been killed in the last three weeks. And in the last one year, over 1,000. I want to ask, uh, is the Secretary General aware in yes, the, the, the Secretary, we, we are very much aware of the violence that we've seen uh, in, North, in, uh, in that part of, of Nigeria. We've seen these horrific attacks uh, by, claimed by Boko Haram of uh, using children, uh, using women as, as suicide bombers. We have condemned these attacks and we will continue uh, to do so. Now this particular one is not Boko Haram, it's an armed herdsman. You know, killing, uh, killing oh, so farmers. I didn't hear. I didn't hear the. I didn't. The, Armed oh, husband killing farmers in North Herds. Central Nigeria. I, uh, I, I let me get back to you. I will have something for you on on that. Sorry, okay, I miss. I misheard your question. Okay, thank you. Uh, 
Luke, you haven't asked yet. On this um, care report, um, the mm -hmm. media mm -hmm. monitoring, um, eight of the 10 most underreported crises are in Africa. Mm -hmm. I'm curious if the UN sees that as a, a pattern and maybe a sign that the messaging strategy on these humanitarian appeals for Africa needs to be rethought? Well, look, uh, you know, we, we try to uh, flag these issues as much as we can. We do it every day uh, from here. Uh, the media are free to make their own, uh, their own choice. Uh, we also understand that, you know, there are constraints to, uh, to coverage as well. Uh, some of these uh, crises are in places that uh, remain very dangerous. Some of these crises remain in places that are hard to, for journalists to access. Um, so we understand those are factors uh, that may very well lead to the low level of coverage. Nizar. Yeah, uh, Mr. Nikki Haley, the U.S. Ambassador, uh, said in Washington recently that her pressure on the United Nations yielded the sacking of a director who labeled Israel as apartheid, something Jimmy Carter, the president, uh, used. So what, is that true? I and don't know. What, what person are you referring to? Well, this is what I'm asking about. If this is true, I know, but I don't, who, who is the director? I, who, who, well, who, I, don't, I don't know. You have who, to. Who is the director? I'm always happy to comment that's... on things, but I need a bit more facts well, before I can do well, so. Well, I can repeat my question. No, I heard you. I heard you. I heard you very clearly, but I can't comment on well, she did not, vague names. She did not name the, the, the director who has been sacked. And she said, a director. Maybe she I, I, Rima listen, I haven't seen maybe. her comment. I don't know what it's referring to, so I really cannot comment. Mr. Lee. Well, was Rima Khalaf sacked or she resigned? My understanding, if I recall, is that she resigned. Under pressure? That's a question for her. Okay, I, I actually want to ask you about one of the, the, the things you did comment on Friday, and it was uh, the, the um, uh, Yuhuru Kenyatta, the president yeah. of Kenya, being named as a global champion of youth by UNICEF. Um, this given rise to a lot of controversy in the country, given the, the, the unrest around the most recent election, including the killing of youth by the government. And I, I, I've come to understand that at least after, I believe after the briefing that we had on Friday, mm -hmm. you, you said that, that there is no appointment or you understood there to be no appointment. Mm -hmm. Is there an appointment or not of, of, of this controversial appointment of Yuhuru Kenyatta as a global champion of youth empowerment by the UN system? I think that's a question for, for UNICEF. My understanding is that uh, the executive director uh, spoke about the need uh, for, uh, for youth uh, to be engaged, uh, and the president said he would support uh, that. But beyond that, I'm not aware of any specific appointment. Okay, and I also wanted to ask, because you <coughs> confirmed on Friday that Mr. Bassanjo was going there mm -hmm. in some capacity, yeah. and it's also been reported that he's gone to the uh, inauguration of George Weah in Liberia. How, how, how lengthy was the trip to Kenya? No, I think it was just a couple of days. Uh, I'm not, uh, as far as his presence in Liberia, I'm not aware that's UN business. Linda. Um, regarding Davos. Yes, ma'am. Um, Ban Ki-moon attended a number mm -hmm. of uh, Davos yeah, conferences yeah. over the years. I was just wondering what the latest is in terms of um, Guterres. No, he will. Uh, he attended last year uh, because of scheduling issues. He will not be going uh, this year. Okay, so thank one, you. Yes, yeah, sure. Go okay, ahead. I just because yeah, the the since the deputy secretary general was there, this controversy has been ongoing mm -hmm. of uh, leaders of southern Cameroons or Ambazonia being held in Nigeria, and yeah. it's said that today they were brought to court and charged with running camps. When she was there, did she learn anything about this? Did she have any communications? Because it's creating quite a... Right, no, I as, I, as soon as I have something, I will share with you. Thank you.